thank you so much for tuning in to the second episode of Just Packing Go um, Travel Series. And tonight, since this is officially hashtag African Month, according to Twitter, this show for me is dedicated to the great continent of Africa. I am very excited about doing this show. We have several folks and we've actually expanded. Um, we actually have Colin from Kenya, who you're gonna hear from. We have um, Metho from, he lives in South Africa, but he is born and bred in Lesotho. We have Denzel, who is South African. We have Rodrik, who is from the Ivory Coast. Uh, we added, and we have Ezekiel from um, Ghana. So I wanted to expand the show from what you've seen in um, advertisements because I found out last night when I was talking to the guys that there are some interesting customs and they are different from country to country. A lot of folks think that, um, you know, cultural customs are African, but they're not. Africa is, of course, comprised of 54 or 55 countries, depending on who you ask. And um, there are a lot of customs that we have. So I want to jump right in and here to let you guys hear some of these customs. If you will come over to Africa, travel around, go on the tours, and you'll see these kind of made for tourists events that, you know, show you or highlight some cult cultural stuff. But a lot of that stuff, whether it's what people are wearing or what they're dancing or what they're doing, a lot of that activity is actually kind of um, ancient and it's not really practiced anymore. But then there's still some that are truly practiced that are overly exciting um, to me. So we're going to start off with, I want to, so Colin, tell us about, um, first tell us about you and then tell us um, about yourself and your tribe and what custom is kind of unique that you think to you guys all right greetings from my from nairobi my name is colin skiplimo i'm a journalist and a public relations student here in Nairobi. i come from the kalenjin tribe of the um, of the kenyan people so kenya basically has around 42 tribes and among the 42 tribes kalenjin is among that and i come from that community as one of the unique customs in my community is um, the naming of the kids when they are born. Uh, we basically name on our kids and our babies from um, the seasons that they are uh, that they are born. If, uh, for example, my name Kiplimo is the Kalenjin name. I was born in the morning hours around 9 a.m. in the morning. That is the time that the, the cattle are released to go and graze and everything else. So when you're born during that time. Chances of are called, you will be called Kiplimo, or if you're a girl, you're, called, you're going to be called Chelimo. So that is the, the time, the 9, 9 a.m. in the morning. So that the custom itself, so if you're going to be born during the rainy season, you will have a name like Prop. So basically, the, the trick is you have to be named according to the season you are born. When, whether it was a, if there was a drought, you will be called Kikeme, and it goes on and on and on, depending on the varieties and the differences uh, of seasons. Charles. That is very interesting because now that I think about it, when I was in Nairobi and we were all together, um, you actually gave me my Kenyan name. Oh, yes. Now, so it's Kamani. And what made you pick that name for me? I liked it once I Googled it and found out what it meant, but what made you pick that name for me? I think basically um, the name I gave you didn't come from my community, but I gave you a name from the Kikuyu community where a friend of ours called Ed is from. And you are charismatic, you are you're an a, a happy person, a very joyful person, and that suits you. So Kimani is your name, Charles. I appreciate, I appreciate that name. That was um, very, very, I love that you did that. Um, so I'm going to go to Denzel. Uh, Denzel, tell us about yourself and tell us what tribe you're from and a little bit of a culture that um, people may not know about. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Denzel Sibanda. Um, I was born here in South Africa, uh, province of 
in a small village called Nep in Skukune. Um, uh, I'm a Tsonga. We speak Shitsonga, which um, should not be confused with Angani in Mali, but our families are quite similar. Um, I was born in a uh, village. I came to Johannesburg. This is where I work. I'm an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur, and that's what I do. In in our culture, what we uh, what is most fascinating is that deal with conflict, discipline, and integration, um, uh, which partly is uh, women. Women play a huge role in our in our custom. Uh, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to uh, discipline, when it comes to integration, uh, whether somebody's been disciplined uh, or not, um, women play a big role. And hence, the initiation schools uh, for women are quite prominent in our, in our culture. Uh, where young girls are taken to be led into uh, motherhood and then they'll be taught uh, how to deal with uh, community conflicts and family conflicts which brings me to um, marriage um, i'm funny enough um, i'm one of a few people who married outside of my tribe in south africa so with a total of 11 uh, official languages which we have i i am married as well uh, which is quite a, a story to tell charles so how many languages actually do you speak? Um, I, I hear all languages in South Africa. I speak around 10 languages. Wow. And so now your wife, you said you guys are from different tribes. What tribe is she from? Yeah, she's Zulu uh, and I'm Tonga. And did that create any problems at all when you got like, what was that process like when you guys were wanting to get married? Because and I, my understanding is, is that there's this whole negotiation process that takes place. And yeah. you were telling me about it one night, and I was just in awe and fascinated. I had saw it on movies, but didn't think it was real. Um, but yeah. tell us a little bit about that negotiation, how that works. Okay, yeah, no, that's, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, as, as much as we have, between cultures, we have a similar way of negotiation. It was quite different because our customer and their customer are quite different. Um, to cut the long story short, we, uh, my parents had to write a letter down to KZN to, to, send, uh, to say we're coming, we've seen uh, what we call a well of water. Uh, so basically meaning, oh, I've seen a wife in your family. And, and then we had to go down and see uh, the parents. But in this process, I have to first sit down my dad, and then my dad calls my uncles. And then he explains to my uncle that uh, Denzel thinks he's a grown man now and he wants a, a wife. And in that process, my uncles then come and call me and interrogate me and tell me, uh, are you sure? And this is what you want to do. And then the letter, letter is sent down to uh, my wife's family. And then the whole process then takes, it's a, it's, a, it's a couple of stages. So it will be the first, the meeting stage, uh, where you bring a gift or, of some sort, where you come in and introduce yourselves and sing praises. So the, the very interesting thing was, I had to sing Zulu praises, which uh, we didn't know, my parents didn't know, my dad didn't know, uh, which was quite interesting. But throughout the process, the two cultures had to uh, put in a compromise. Charles. So, I, and I got to ask you one more question, Denzel. So now tell me, okay. if, so every, in the U.S., a relationship between a father and a daughter, you know, is, is pretty special. And okay. tell me if the, the, about the relationship between a father and a daughter once that daughter gets married. Like if that father needed something from his daughter, how does that work? Does he just pick up the phone and say, you know, Hey, I da, da, da. how does that work once she gets married? Um, it, it's quite different uh, um, um, in, in, in our cultures, both our cultures, where now because I'm married, then we become a young, we become a family. Then me becoming head of the family, then uh, the parents need to call and consult with me, straight with me, direct with me. So I can take decision for the family. So it wouldn't be a, a matter of, even though they have a special relationship, of course, uh, but uh, culturally, as the man of the house, then the decision has to come down to uh, to me, Charles. So if 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 he needed something from her, she he would actually have to ask your permission first, and as opposed to going directly to her. And I just found that interesting because I can only imagine 
Um, I'm divorced, but I can only okay. imagine if my ex-wife's father even thought about the concept of having to come to me before he asked his daughter for something. That was that that amazed me when you told me that story. Yes, of course. Um, when when it comes to, when it comes to the child, you, you find that um, the, during the whole wedding process. So what we go through, we go through um, three stages of our wedding processes. So what the first one will be when we do the negotiations, and then the second one is when we finish the negotiations and we do um, what what we call sort of a celebration where blood needs to be spilled between the two families in order to come about. And then the third one is when the, her parents bring her to my house. Then they will bring her with some sort of, 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 um, of, a, case, of, a, case, of a case, basically saying we're handing her over to you as the family. So that's where the respect comes in, where then the family needs to respect the whole process, meaning going through me as a family, not that because she belongs to our, to our clan. So that's where you get the whole process of them consulting or talking to me or either uh, asking if needs be for anything uh, through the family. Charles? Amazing. Thank you so much for that. I am now yeah. going to actually go to Metho, um, who is here in Johannesburg from Lesotho. Um, I am actually going to, before you tell us about your custom, tell us, is that similar? Because I know you're married. Is it similar based on um, your cultural customs of your country? Is marriage handled the same way? Thank you, Charles. Um, indeed, that, 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 that is identical. Um, really, yeah, that, that, that's identical. Maybe we can justify on issue of uh, the differences, but the principles, the custom and that adhere to, to is quite similar. Got you. So to back up, anyway, tell everybody what you do here in South Africa. Thank you. I am Mesoma Kulu Mawona, I'm Tim Kulu. Uh, I was born and raised in Lesotho. I came to South Africa sometime in 98 to finish my high school. So then I have since finished my high school and I have graduated from University of Johannesburg with LB degree, and I'm currently practicing advocate of high court, and I stay in Johannesburg. Okay, that's um, great. Now tell us about some of your customs there. In particular, within the Zulu culture, um, mm -hmm. it is something called it's how the Zulus used to add, to establish the the opportunity of a child. Um, the story goes in this, in this way. Remember that we as Africans generally, we, we, we really, really believe in our ancestors, that they live with us, that spirit is here, they protect us, and they are very, very um, jealous of us. Now, this is how things work. Let's say, for example, the Mtimkulu house, you'll have a very small uh, house. It's called M Samo, M Samo. Uh, directly translated, it means the pillow, the pillow house, Msam. Now, the belief in our culture as Africans is that that is where our ancestors, our forefathers and our, our for, for grandmothers, that's where they live. Now, the event that a girl or a lady alleges pregnancy by one of our own, the only way that our forefathers used to do things. I, I think very few people still do that now. Um, is that when the child is born, this child will be taken to M. Samo. And remember that they believe this in that house. That's where the entire clan, ancestral and our wife, of the Mtimukulu, lives. So now, here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a if that child is indeed empty, he or she will survive. But in the event that the child is not uh, who the mother claims to be, that child will die on the spot. And that's how the paternity was established 
in a zoo culture. Thank you, Charles. Wow. Thank you. Very interesting. I'm going to wrap back around to you. We have covered East Africa and Kenya. We've covered South Africa with both South Africa and Lesotho. Let's take it up to West Africa. I'm going to start with the Ivory Coast, mainly because I can't say Cote d'Ivoire. So I'm just going to call it Ivory Coast. <laughs> but anyways, we're going to go to um, Rodrigue and introduce yourself for us and tell us a little bit about your culture. Hi guys, hi Charles. Nice joining you. Let me tell you uh, something about me. I'm Roderick from Ivory Coast. I studied in South Africa, so that, this, that is why I learned English. I work in a company who is specialized in uh, cleaning, industrial cleaning. Wait, you said you started in South Africa. Were you born in South yes. Africa? Oh no, in Ivory Coast, but I spent like five years there from 20, what, 28, 2008 to 2012. So. And tell us about some of you guys' customs. Uh, what I would like to share tonight is a custom, a, a, a little special custom. It's about twins. So what they do in my culture is a culture we mainly in um, south of Ivory Coast. Another thing is we are from Ghana. Originally, we are Nzima from Ghana, but we moved to Ivory Coast like a long time ago, so I don't even know the year. The thing is for twins, they do a special uh, ceremonial uh, custom which is based on celebrating twins. <clears throat> Sorry. So what they do, normally the non-Christian people, they, mm, they celebrate twins by doing a special party for them. Two weeks after they're born, they do that party. So the power of twins is celebrated uh, through the family. And why do they do that for twins? What, what is uh, it when I, about twins? When I asked, uh, they told me is to acknowledge their power. So they believe that twins come with a, a certain power. So that power needs to be acknowledged and they put it in, uh, they highlight it by celebrating it. So then they become more powerful. They become the, the proper twins within the culture. Okay, yes. that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, You're welcome. I saved Ghana for last yes. because Ghana was a really big focal point for African Americans last year. Everybody did the yes. return. And, you know, I met some folks over there, and there's an interesting culture that is in Ghana, and you get to go out on all these tours and stuff. So I brought yes. in one, um, Samuel who is, I'm going to personally plug, um, is of Samaware um, sandals. He hand make them, hand design and hand make sandals. And he made me a couple of pairs. So that's why I wanted to make sure I got that plug in. Um, <laughs> hey, Sam, tell us. <laughs> I've told him now about you and your business. <laughs> tell us about a custom that you're familiar with. Well, tell us what tribe you're from and a custom that is associated with your tribe. Um, hello, everybody. It's been nice meeting you and knowing you from different parts of Africa. Um, my name is Sam, as um, Charles has already mentioned, and I'm an entrepreneur. One of my products, um, one of my businesses is uh, footwear, like Charles already said. We are specialized in making um, custom footwear. Yeah, I actually try to... Uh, um, Graduated from the university um, with a, a degree in accounting, but um, I geared into manufacturing. You know, okay, so that's a little bit about me. I'm a Ga, a Ga, I'm an Adangbe, and the tribe is Ga Adangbe. Yeah, so I'm an Adangbe, and the, the tribe is Ga Adangbe. I'd like to share just a little, I'd just like to share something about their cultural ceremonial um thing that we do when we when we give birth to children 
okay, so now when we when a child is born, so when I give birth to my child, um, I'm the man, and to name the child, I have to consult with my father. So, and when the ceremony is going to, the naming ceremony is going to take place, it needs to take place for my, for my father's home. So it means the child's paternal home, uh, paternal grandfather's home. So basically, um, during, this, during this occasion, early dawn before sunrise, um, the family meets together with the old man. When I say old man, I mean the, um, the head of family and the, the man, the, the child's grandfather and people of, uh, of good caliber in the, in, the, in, the, in the family. The reason is this, that, uh, you know, so the child, as from birth, it is assumed or it is wished that the child um, has or is, 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 is with people with good character. Yeah, so they organize men and yeah, men and women of good character um, to do the outdooring. The outdooring process basically is, um, is in, I'll say, three steps. One, they adore the child um, by holding the child, naming the child. Like I said, the name comes in collaboration with the man and the man's father. So they collaborate and then they come up with a child's name. The child's name, most definitely, like I think other African countries do actually uh, must have the same name, that is the family name. Yeah. So they adore the name, they bring out the name, the family head or one one of one of the um, the good people holds the child. So they throw water, they throw water on top, usually. Um, in, in the olden times, um, there were in story buildings, you know, most of the, 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 the buildings were like a, a ground floor level kind of building. So they throw water over the roof and then it sprinkles down. They put a child on the floor and it sprinkle, the water sprinkles down onto the child. That basically um, symbolizes um, or makes, yeah, symbolizes um, um, the fact that in life, you you won't get everything rosy. You may be beaten by rain, and life is not just about it being rosy. Okay, so after that, then um, the baby is being carried and given um, water. So it's being dipped. Water is being dipped on the tongue of the baby, and um, they usually do, let's say, whiskey or hard liquor. You know, so they dip their hands or finger into the hand liquor and then dips it into the mouth of the child. And that basically is to, to signify um, principles of truth and what truth and um, the fact that if you, so as they do, as they perform that, they tell the child, okay, so this is water. When you see, when you, when, when you grow up and, um, you you taste water say it is water you know and then the whiskey or the hard liquor or the hard drink they, they they give that as well and then they say this is whiskey or this is wine it is um so the um when you grow up you have to know what good is from bad so good is more or less sim symbolizes the water and then bad like the hard liquor and also, also truth also symbolizes, let's say, water, and then um, 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 untrue or lies or false or false things actually symbolizes the um, the hard liquor or the whiskey. Yeah. So after this is done, after this is done to the child, now the name of the child is outdone, and they usually put. Um, in our forefathers' time, they used this appetition, you know. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 that is the, 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 the local name of, um, I'll say, gin or let's say whiskey. You know, we have appetition, we have palm wine, you know, we have corn wine, 
you know, and those are the main things that are used in, 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 in making, in performing this right for the child. Oh. Collins, you had something you want to say? Yeah. I'm just thinking, isn't it uh, hazardous to get uh, uh, alcohol of that percentage to uh, a newborn? Isn't it hazardous to their health? Uh, because um, the, the same cast uh, similar wife to one another tribe here in Kenya, but then then they use um, they get the, the they give the the baby um, paper, and then they give uh, the baby honey just to uh, to give the two comparisons of the two extremes of life that uh, you will have the bitter part of life and then you will have the sweet part of life. Then they would use pepper and uh, and honey. But my concern is uh, of the alcohol content to the baby. My yeah. Okay. So um, it's just a dip. It's just a dip. And this strictly, this strictly was done like years ago, like about 40, 50 years ago. They was they strictly used proper alcohol. But this time around, um, this time around they used Juice, let's say juice, um, non-alcoholic um, beverages. So this time around, because parents do not really want, like you, <laughs> parents do not really want their children to have alcohol. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sam. I'm actually going to go to Ezekiel, who um, is also in Ghana, but specifically, oh. I'm going to ask him to kind of step out of his, um, I guess, birthright as a man and tell us a little bit about a special kind of custom that is applicable in his tribe from for women, females. And what tribe are you from? Okay, I'm an Ashanti. Okay. Good evening. Yeah, um, this is Ezekiel here, and I'm a Ghanaian. I'm half Ashanti, half Adna, but with Ashanti, when the mom, with my side, when the mom is yeah, the mom is an Ashanti. You have to, so I hear it from my mom. My mom say. So in Ashanti, we have this custom that's called bragro. That's in the local dialogue. When you bring it to English, that's puberty rights. Puberty rights is when a lady comes of age. A lady experiences her first cycle, I mean, menstrual cycle. For example, I'm using myself as a lady. I get my first menstrual cycle. I tell my mom, my mom will take me to the queen mother of my town and go and test menstrual cycle. So the queen mother will take very good care of me, be aware that I was not so with that. I will stay with the queen mother for some time. And through that period, I'll be taken to the riverside. They're going to bat me with. They believe in their traditional stuff. So you're gonna bag me with water at the river. After I'll come back, they'll dress me. That's when our beads uh gold, Ashanti candle. We know Ashanti is like beads, they like on the yeah, the gold and all those stuff they can take. So they'll clothe me with one, fix all the beads on me, and bring me outside for people to know this is my first puberty, right? Like my first measure as I can. They do that to introduce you to womanhood. Because you are you are growing and you are now you have reached the stage that somebody can pick you up and marry you. So when they bring you out, kids will be around. They will do a talk. They will prepare a talk. A talk is a food in is a food in Ashanti that you can use corn. You can use yam. You can use plantain to prepare it. So when they do their talk, and they will add eggs to it. The eggs signifies the kids that you're gonna bear. So there is a custom with it that when they bring you the talk, you're supposed to swallow the egg. Don't bite it. You sh the egg shouldn't be bitten by your teeth. You just have to swallow it. If you're able to swallow it, that's the kids that you're gonna have. That means you have a strong womb that you're gonna bear a lot of children. It's a custom that I've seen. I know it's a bit, it's fair about it because you look at the size of an egg. And when the reason why Ashantis use egg is they cherish egg a lot. They hold egg like a human being. You know, egg is a bit fragile. No, it's not a bit, it's fragile. So when you leave egg and it falls, it, it cracks. So that's why they will, they will boil the egg for you to swallow. If you're able to swallow it with your teeth not bitten, yeah, that's the, it's gonna indicate the case that you're gonna have. 
So you are supposed to do it. So when you do it, and they will let you eat some of their talk as well. So after eating their talk, you call the kids around and they will rush to their talk. So when they get to their talk and they eat it, that also signifies that that means you, if there are a lot of kids, for example, if 10 kids all run to it, that means you have, you have the purpose of bearing 10 and above kids. If wow. 20 comes, that means you are going to bear a lot of kids. That's what the custom requires. So after that, they will call the men in the hood, I mean the community, for they also come and look at you and see, yeah, right now you are, you have come of age, you are a lady that you, you are up for marriage. So they do that to also let it, I mean, to portray that, yeah, you, you didn't go in for like this bad life or something. You, you went in for a virtual life, like a virtual life, how you go like virtual lady, a virtuous lady, sorry. So that's what happens. So after it's done, people can come in to come and be like, oh, I want to marry you. So I can pay your bride price and I'll be taking very good care of you till you come of age and I get married to you. That's one thing with Ashanti. The, the difficult part is when you are selling the egg. That's a bit difficult, yeah, because we all know the size of eggs and you have to sell it without a bite, yeah. So that's one part of it. Crobos do have the same thing, but Crobos do one is called Dipo. But Ashanti, they call it Bragua. Yeah. Got you. Well, thank you for sharing that. What I want to do is remind folks, um, if you have questions, make sure that you um, go down on your Zoom screen and make sure you're showing your participant screen um, and your chat screen. If you click on participants or chat and chat, you will see both of those screens if you don't have them up. Um, you can then use that little hand signal on there and raise your hand and we'll see it and let you ask, um, ask your question. I do, while you guys are thinking about your questions or raising your hands, I wanted to ask the group um, a couple of questions. And anybody can chime in um, from the group. But my first question is, what you've heard from your fellow Africans, um, is there any country or tribe specific that you didn't know about um, existed that was surprising to you or you pretty much knew about it anyways feel free to, to hop in and once somebody starts talking let them talk oh yeah well Charles uh, I would say for me I didn't know um, uh, about the Ghanaian um, cultures especially so in the egg I'm kind of in or like most people basically I'm kind of uh, it's Swallowing the egg whole. Uh, I, I think the, we, we have this kind of whole secret when a woman uh, comes of age. I think I think it's not like it, 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 it cuts across all cultures. When a woman comes of age, it, it, it looks like it, it is something which we, we hold we hold dear in 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 our cultures. But I didn't know anything about it. That's surprising for me. We got a question in from Tina Williams. So I'm going to go to Tina. Hey, Tina. Hey, you guys. It's Tina um, from California, but living in South Africa. Um, I have a question for, for the two gentlemen um, from Ghana. Um, I understand that naming ceremonies are really for babies. Do people in Ghana, do they find it unusual that um, African Americans want to do naming ceremonies? I've heard before that that is a bit disrespectful. Is that true? So um, last year, last year in Ghana was, um, was called the year of return. So basically the year of return was um, to invite um, African Americans from the diaspora to come down home to to celebrate and also to, to more or less bond with their roots from where they come from. Um, naming, ceremony for, for, naming ceremony basically are for children or usually are for children, but it doesn't take it from the fact that the girls are. You know, some, some people, some people, even they live in Ghana, they've never traveled and all, but 
when their when their fathers um, impregnate their mothers, sometimes certain things happen. And then their mothers go away with a child, with a with a with a children. So it happens that they are far because naming ceremony basically is a duty of the paternal, you know, side. It's a duty of the paternal side. So until the paternal side comes out with a name, you don't you do not have, I would say, a proper name. Yeah. So irrespective of the age that you are. Last year, for example, I I have I have friends from the US who came to Ghana and they went to specifically the um, Ashanti region and specifically also to, a, a, I would say, a village called Himan, Himan in the Ashanti region. And a, a naming ceremony was performed to more or less embrace them. You know, you can have a name, but um, for you to have a, a, a home name, let's say, for you to have a proper say name, you know, you need to be outdone. You know, so a ceremony, like a naming ceremony, uh, is, is performed. So with that, your 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 um, what's the name? You are done. People come together. They make merry and all. So they 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 show you your new name. You know, and and basically that. So uh, elderly people as well. Some people are in their fifties, sixties. It doesn't really matter. You know, so irrespective of the age, you can come home and then your fathers will adore you and give you a brand new name. That's um, where, um, where, wherever you mention that name, you can be traced to a particular village or a particular home. Um, really, really interesting. For me, I was wondering, with the whole COVID-19 thing going on, how have you seen that affect any of your customs that are traditional for you? And how is it affecting um, whether or not you live in the in a village um, versus living in, say, the city, for example? I'll go to you, Colin. Uh, the comparison about um, the, the, the COVID-19, um, comparing especially, uh, unlike uh, what we would think always and say uh, it would spread mainly in the rural areas because one, they do not know much about it, maybe the information is not out there. It is very different here in Kenya. It is 80%, um, 70% uh, of these, um, of the many um, infections happen in the urban centers. Like for example, Nairobi has around 80%. Uh, the coastal city of Mombasa, comes in second with the other 20%. And so you will find it's because, and mainly because we are so crowded in the urban centers and in the cities, unlike the rural areas where they have, they have plenty of spaces. They have, I mean, from one, uh, one household to the other one, they, they, it's, it's a huge chunk of land. And so getting a lot of these cases is mainly in the urban centers where, especially in the shanties and the slums, where there's the billions of people crowded. I mean, the houses are just separated by one uh, sheet or something. Uh, so that really facilitates because you'll find a lot of um, a lot of cases are picked from slum areas and the places where there are very many people living there. Charles. Wow. All right, makes sense now. So a question for um, Roderick in um, Ivory Coast. The yes. that you described now, does that differ depending on whether a family, family comes from means, whether they're rich or poor, or it can pretty much stay the same across kind of eating divide? Uh, thank you, Chuck. I think it depends on the, how linked the people are to their customs. No matter how rich or poor, but uh, some people just are more close to their cultural customs than others so i think it doesn't really matter it depends on each person got you so now this question i i i have to it, every time i think about it and i hope no one else gets as cringed about it as i do but it's the i it's, it has to deal with circumcision and the stories that i've heard across it seems all countries whether it is eight years old or 12 years old or whatever it is not zero years old from when a person is born when a male is born 
Um, is there any one of you that have any particular um, story for males and how you guys handle circumcision in your country or your tribe? Um, yes, Charles. So when it comes to um, our culture, the Tsonga tribe, uh, circumcision is still hold um, it still hold a, a very secret place. Um, and with us, it's, it's quite unique. Uh, it is done between um, females to it and males to it. So when it comes to us, the age where you, you, you become a boy, so when you a teenagehood, basically, from 11 to about 13, that's where um, you are promised to go to initiation school. And I would say most people still practice it, uh, where you find other people don't practice it because of Christianity as well. Um, they tend to move away, go to hospitals, but which is still widely, nevertheless, is still uh, widely practiced in Limpopo, uh, uh, where I come from, from the province, uh, where kids from the age of, uh, from about 12, 11, 12, all the way to 16, uh, they're taken to the mountains. Uh, for the initiation school. It takes about six weeks in our culture um, so to, for, for the whole process. So the, the cutting of the four skin itself is just part of, of the initiation, but uh, the whole process uh, encompasses uh, teaching you about manhood uh, or about uh, femalehood. Uh, in, 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 in the whole process, you learn how to treat both female and male and what is your role in the community and what is expected of you in the community, including um, how you're supposed to go about your marriage and how you're supposed to, to, to treat your wife and your in-laws. So the whole six weeks, basically, because uh, when you're going through the healing process, it will be about um, teaching you about um, life, basically, and how you're supposed to be treating others uh, in both ways. So in, in both female and, uh, and male um, uh, initiation schools, uh, a part of us is cut, um, so to say. Um, so in both in female and both in male. So with female, it will be a part of their, their private parts, which um, they, they, they go, they go and cut. Um, it's either uh, to be more uh, specific, whatever part of the ribs they, they might be cutting, which we don't really know as men, whatever they do. Uh, but with us as well, they continue is cutting of the foreskin. But that itself holds secret for the period of those six weeks. Um, it's still practiced widely. Even if you live in an urban area, uh, most most of the, the guys I know, what they do when their kids reach that age, they send them back home to Limpopo to, for the, that six week. So uh, which we have a sort of a cultural clash between the urban and the rural areas where during that six week, kids cannot miss school, but most people still hold it dear. They don't mind sacrificing the six week of school for the initiation school, Charles. Thank you, sir. Thank all of you guys. Um, what I wanted to make sure that I did is anybody who was on the speaking guest, if you want to show, share your social media, drop it down on the chat because I'm sure some people will have some more stuff they want to talk to you about. So feel free to drop your social media down on the chat if you want folks to reach out to you. Um, I'm excited. I, I mean, every time I talk to any of you guys about your customs, it has educated me. And I have a Ghana name that was given to me. I have a Kenya name that was given to me. And it's funny because I have actually kind of declared myself Zulu. And they don't actually do circumcision. And I think that's probably why, because if it didn't happen to me when I was a young, when I was born, it ain't going to happen to me afterwards. So. I'm definitely thinking that Zulu is a route to go for me. Um, anyways, thank you guys so much. I definitely want to thank um, the sponsors of this episode, um, Gloss Communications and um, Psychiatry of Atlanta, for their in-kind support. I also wanted to make sure I let you guys know about the next show in two weeks, which is still a little early to think about. But at some point, we're definitely going to come out of um, the coronavirus situation and we're going to be traveling again. And so the next episode is going to be 
about traveling the world told to us by solo travels, people who travel by themselves, the ups and downs and the safety of traveling the world by yourself. So that's going to be on the 27th. I'm really excited about that. Um, so make sure you tune in. I appreciate everybody for tuning in to this episode. I appreciate all of our guests for sharing um, just amazing, amazing cultural um, customs of each of your countries. And I suspect that even in your countries, you've learned something new about um, some things that happen on this great continent that we call Mother Africa. Um, I'm wishing all you guys yeah. the African month. And thank you so much. Thank you, you for Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.